I'm really delighted to be here. It's my first visit to see you, and my first visit um, has been uh, terrific. Um, you are very lucky um, to uh, to have such, I think, a global uh, perspective, such great uh, faculty in a great location, I must add. Um, very few universities, I think, get to be in the center of, uh, of so many uh, splendid um, landmarks. So I think this um, really is like the LSE of the East. <laughs> and so um, I, I'm really delighted to be here to speak speak on a topic that um, I have been looking at for quite a long time. Um, and what I hope to do in the next, say, 50 minutes or so is to give you a talk based on uh, my latest book, um, which was published by Oxford University Press and out in Chinese, actually, and published by Citic Press in Beijing in the last few months. And the title of the book is China's Growth, the Making of an Economic Superpower. Now, like lots of academics, my books are uh, non-creatively titled. This original title was China's Growth because the, uh, one of the books before that was called The Economy of China. <laughs> but OUP, I think, was hoping that um, we might uh, be able to uh, maybe sell a few copies, so I was encouraged to think about a subtitle. And um, so the subtitle is The Making of an Economic Superpower. Now, some people look at the subtitle and think, well, yeah, of course, China is an economic superpower. And there's others who think, well, they might have the makings of one, but not quite. And I think that really um, captures, I think, the, the theme of, of my talk. Um, so, what I hope to do is to go through with you two main points uh, in terms of China's growth. There's obviously lots and lots of points where uh, there's no way to, uh, to comprehensively uh, cover it um, in one lecture, much less um, a course. Um, China is that complicated um, an economy. But the, the two main questions that I want to explore with you are first, a very simple question in many ways, but the answer is not um, not so simple, which is, what has driven China's growth? Um, so when I started uh, writing this book, um, I had already done uh, several books and articles around questions of Chinese growth, but this book allowed me to step back and ask the question which should be of interest really to anyone, which is looking at all of the evidence. What is the evidence around Chinese growth. In other words, what, are, what has happened in the last 30, 35 years? Um, what are the growth components? And once you understand those, then you can look ahead and ask yourself, are these growth drivers sufficient to lead China into the next era of growth? Because obviously the next era will be challenging. And the next era is focused on one main uh, goal for the Chinese policymakers which is can China overcome the middle income country trap? So in other words, um, the World Bank estimates that there were 101 middle income countries in 1960. By 2008, only about a dozen of those had become prosperous. So in other words, most countries, when they hit middle income levels, stay there and they become trapped. They never join the ranks of rich countries. And China's goal, having lifted its 1.3 billion people out of poverty in the last 30 years, is for the next 30 years to lift them into prosperity. If you think about it, that's hugely ambitious to raise one-fifth of the world's population into the ranks of rich countries. If they can manage this, it will transform the global economy, I have no doubt. Um, when you think about it, the US led global growth um, with their, in the 1980s, about a quarter of a billion people. Um, China has another billion people on top of that. So it is a tremendous, tremendous um, opportunity, but also challenge. And those are the things that I'm going to focus on um, in what I call the rebalancing challenges. So the first thing to say is China has rapidly become the world's second biggest economy. And it's now um, just behind the United States. But this gives you um, the kind of dates in which it passed most members of the G7. And it is an impressive achievement. Um, 
But if you can see the exponential improvement in average incomes adjusted for purchasing power parity, uh, but that exponential growth rate, it tends to be associated with countries in the catch-up phase of growth. So developing countries tend to grow more quickly. Um, so once it reaches middle income, China will slow. But even if it slows, it will hit that average income at the trap level within about a decade. So right now that trap level is around 14 to 15,000 US dollars per capita adjusted for PPP. And China's average income now is just over $8,000. How can you work this out? There's a rule of thumb called the rule of 70. If you take the number 70, you divide it by the growth rate, that gives you the number of years it takes for an economy to double in size. So China used to grow at nearly 10% on average, so its economy was doubling in size every seven years, and that's the exponential improvements you can see in terms of size of economy. So if China slows down to 7% growth, its economy will still double in size in a decade. So it is still an impressive growth rate. Slower than before, but still impressive. Now, if Europe grows at 1%, we can look forward to our incomes doubling in 70 years. So small changes in compound growth rates mean a lot. Don't think too much about European incomes, otherwise you're all going to want to move to China, so I'm just going to move on. <laughs> um, this is... Um, a map of Chinese growth rates against reforms. I don't have time to go through all the institutional reforms, but what I'm going to suggest um, is that China has business cycles, so I wouldn't read too much into the ups and downs of, uh, e of an economy, because it would be very unusual for an economy not to have business cycles. And the reason I show this chart is because uh, reforms don't necessarily lead to immediate improvements in growth. Institutional reforms take time. And China has had a number of reforms, a huge number of reforms um, that we can go through, but they don't necessarily, anything that's done now wouldn't necessarily immediately uh, improve the structural um, structure of the economy. So word about China's impressive growth. Um, this gives you the uh, growth rate. Now, rightly so, many of you would be wondering about the reliability of Chinese statistics. And I would say the macro data certainly has a number of uh, challenges. Um, the thing that I should probably say about the macro data is that most of you would be aware of the political bias in macro data. In other words, if you're a policymaker, you're not going to miss your growth target. So everyone meets their growth target and there's an upward bias to the data. But I'm not going to ask for a show of hands because I don't want to get anyone in trouble. How many of you have not gotten a receipt for a purchase in China? Doesn't even have to be counterfeit DVDs or anything like that. <laughs> uh, but China has a massive uh, informal economy, like most developing countries. So the gray economy in, for instance, um, North Africa is estimated to be as large as 40 to 50 percent of GDP. So China statistics are also likely to be underreported because half its population now, now, even now, is about is in rural areas. So there's a lot of unrecorded economic activity. Now, I'm not suggesting that the upward bias and the downward bias cancel each other out. I'm merely suggesting there are two sources of errors in terms of macro measurements. So the more reliable data tends to be micro data, household surveys, firm level surveys. So the evidence that I'm going to show you around Chinese growth is largely derived from um, economic and other articles based on micro data. Um, so this is uh, uh, academics researching China's economy using firm level or household level data and trying to estimate China's growth components using micro data, which of course, if you think about macroeconomics, micro foundations are the um, conceptual framework underpinning macroeconomic trends. So in that sense, uh, what I'm going to present to you is around um, 
using more reliable microdata versus, say, the macrodata. And just before you panic, there are no econometrics in this presentation. <laughs> but if you're interested in those, past page 60 of the book, tons of it for you to get into. Okay, so China's growth drivers. Um, the first thing to say is since 1979, China has grown at around 9.6%. Um, now, just as a quick reminder, in 1979, China adopted market-oriented reforms. So from 49 to 79, it was a centrally planned economy, a command system, and followed the Soviet model for a time, and very focused on heavy industry, very small urban area, but very well provided for urban area, and a very large rural economy. But in 1979, China started market-oriented reforms, and that is what we call the reform period, or some people would call the current period, the post-reform period. I'm not so worried about nomenclature. Um, but from 49 to 79, um, that was under um, a very different economic system. And in the 30s years or so, since 79, China has become a more market-based economy. Now, there's one thing I'm probably going to say just from the start, is I don't use the word capitalist very much at all. <laughs> it's because um, I would always say China is undergoing marketization. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a term that the Chinese use more than anything else because that's how they view it. A very gradual process of injecting market-based forces and incentives into the planned economy and the gradual liberalization of parts of the economy, I think is a more accurate way of thinking about Chinese reforms than almost anything else. The political system, of course, has undergone changes, but there wasn't the massive liberalization of the economic and political system that the former Soviet Union, and of course, here um, in Eastern Europe, Central Europe, uh, that, under, that was undergone um, in the early 1990s. China didn't do that. China underwent a very gradual reform process, which, by the way, is not necessarily um, optimal. In other words, the gradual reform sequence is described as an easy to hard reform sequence. So what it does is that instead of maximizing economic efficiency, it minimizes implementation costs, but that has a tendency to put off harder reforms until later on in the process, such as reforming state-owned enterprises that I'm going to go into. In other words, what was easy to reform are things like injecting incentives into agriculture. What's harder to reform is dismantling the control of state-owned enterprises by powerful uh, affiliates of the uh, Communist Party of China, which is obviously um, still very influential. And I'll show you why state-owned enterprises haven't disappeared in uh, China and is an issue now in terms of um, reform. So this gradualist process, this, this injection of market incentives, a very paced opening up of the economy, including to the global economy, um, I think are some of the main traits of Chinese reform. So um, just a quick word on opening up. Um, in terms of growth components, it's part of what we would think about um, but uh, just uh, you know, for those of you who um, have, uh, know that China is the world's biggest trader, China's opening up is actually very gradual. So it may be the world's biggest trader, but it's a controlled opening. So China attracted foreign direct investment into essentially export processing zones, but they didn't, for instance, open up the domestic economy initially. It was only after China joined the World Trade Organization in 2001 that it agreed to liberalize and open up more to domestic competition and areas of services. That's very different than how a lot of developing countries open up. Um, so um, when we talk about liberalization, always think of it, in China's case, as a gradual liberalization. It's rarely full liberalization. Um, by the way, um, China is now a massive overseas investor, um, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, and you know, one of the challenges for developing countries facing Chinese investment is whether they can extract the same positive spillovers from foreign investment in terms of technology, managerial know-how that the Chinese are able to gain from foreign investment into China. And that isn't 
always so straightforward. It can be quite challenging um, if you are in a country that doesn't have 1.3 billion people in the world's, you know, one of the world's biggest markets. Um, so that's a backdrop to uh, what's behind the growth uh, experience. But now let me go into how you break down Chinese growth drivers. So the economists, economists um, in many ways uh, are trying to capture main components about uh, what comprises GDP, gross domestic product. So about 60 to 70 percent of Chinese growth, it comes from factor accumulation. So that's adding workers and adding capital. And that leaves the residual, the unexplained portion of increasing output, not attributed to adding workers and adding investment to TFP, total factor productivity. So this is known in classical neoclassical economics as a solo residual. So this is the portion that can't be explained just by adding uh, things you can count. Now, of course, TFP is not all innovation or productivity. And I'll try to look into that um, black box with you in a moment. So, um, but that is, at a first glance, how Chinese growth breaks down. And if you look at it more closely, about half of China's growth, and again gleaned from economic studies, comes from capital accumulation. That is very common to developing countries. If you look across, for instance, East Asia, most of the growth will come from capital, adding capital, adding investment. And for the past 30 years or so, that's been the main driver of Chinese growth. It's also why when China needs a growth boost, it quickly turns to investment because it's such a big driver of its growth rate. But at some point, you can end up with bridges to nowhere, um, or in China's case, ghost cities, if the investment ceases to be efficient um, or productive because there is a, uh, there is a uh, danger of too much debt that can come from inefficient investment. And one of China's challenges now is that the fiscal stimulus used after the 2008 global financial crisis was centered on boosting growth via investment predominantly. And that's resulted in a large amount of debt in China. And that can, of course, lead to pressures on the banking system. It can lead to overcapacity in Chinese industry. And these are some of the reasons why, as a growth driver looking ahead, investment alone isn't going to be a great um, way to proceed. So it's driven China's growth in the past, but for a middle-income country, it's unlikely to be, it shouldn't be, a, the biggest growth driver looking ahead. There needs to be other drivers, and let me go through um, some of those in a moment. But the other thing to say is about um, adding workers. So 10 to 20 percent of China's growth can be accounted for by um, adding uh, people. Now that's relatively low as a growth driver and the reason is twofold. One is China has a one-child policy. So that means that the Chinese working age population has now been shrinking for a couple of years and that's also that means that adding workers um, is hasn't been a growth a major growth driver um, in the past and may not be in the future. They're now reversing the one-child policy, um, but fertility rates tend to decline with development. That's the trend in OECD countries. Now, we can have a discussion later on about whether China might be able to reverse its one-child policy. After all, it was an artificial constraint. Um, but there's going to have to be, I think, a lot more uh, support for uh, things like uh, maternity leave, um, if that were to be the case. Um, so that is one of the reasons why hum uh, adding people hasn't been a big growth driver. The second reason is that women in China participate in the labor market at far higher rates than other major economies. So Mao Zedong said women hold a path the sky. Um, so under central planning, women worked nearly at the same rates as men, and in the reform period, the labor force participation rates of women are about 10 percentage points higher than Western Europe and, and the United States, and substantially higher than Japan. So in Western Europe, adding women to the workforce in the post-war period 
was able to boost growth um, substantially. And Japan is now trying to do that with womenomics, but in China, women are already participants in the workforce. So that means that when reform started in 79, adding women wasn't a big growth driver. Um, now, one of my, uh, looking at this issue, one of my, um, uh, one of the things that I noticed was that under central planning, a man would get 10 work points for a day's work. Um, and even though women held up half the sky, a woman doing a day's work would get eight work points. So what bothers me about the gender wage gap then is that even when nobody did any work, there was still a gender wage gap. Because <laughs> under central planning, obviously, there's no, you know, no incentive to work. Um, and actually, by the way, it's gotten worse. <laughs> so, uh, but anyways, that's why. Uh, adding workers hasn't been a big growth driver for China. Now, onto the really interesting stuff around explaining productivity. This is obviously the key to sustaining China's growth going forward. Um, this is very hard, by the way, uh, looking into a black box or uh, in the case of my limited PowerPoint abilities, my black circle. Um, but if you look at um, studies that try to break down TFP, about a third of TFP can be attributed to human capital. So in other words, you don't need more workers. You need better educated, more skilled workers. That's obviously a much better source of productivity improvements to boost your growth rate. Um, and in China, educational levels have always been actually very good at the primary and secondary school levels, which is why they were able to plug into global supply chains and to upgrade industry. Um, and they're now increasing enrollment at the tertiary level. So tertiary university educational level postgraduate studies, these have grown tremendously in the past couple of decades or so. The challenge now is not necessarily demand, it's actually the supply of education. So China, one of China's main goals is to create 10 million new jobs a year in order to uh, supply its graduates with work, but that can be challenging. Now, lots of people put this down to a challenge, obviously, that many countries face, but in China's case, I would also look at the supply of education. Um, in other words, it's hard to build up universities very quickly, and there's such a demand for education, you do see a lot of Chinese studies, uh, Chinese students studying overseas, for instance. So domestically, the universities still need, um, especially outside of um, Beijing and Shanghai and the coast, in Zhejiang province and all the more developed regions, um, they need a lot more supply of higher education outside of those regions. And for instance, um, I went to study unemployment in uh, China and I went to Chengdu, which is uh, in Sichuan province, so in the center of China. Chengdu is very developed, um, Sichuan province is very developed. Delicious food, by the way. I highly encourage studies of China to aim for um, provinces where food, you, you know, you. It, it didn't really work for me, though. When I was a graduate student, I was studying uh, unemployment as part of the Xiaogang policy, the layoff policies um, of the late 1990s. And um, I was really keen to go and study it in a sunny, warm province in the south. And instead, uh, we ended up in the hard-hit northeast um, in Liaoning province, and, um, and, and we were uh, in the northeast of China um, doing this study in, f in freezing cold winter, and I was helpfully told that um, uh, it was the coldest winter in a hundred years. <laughs> And I thought, I'm somehow not doing this right. But obviously, the Northeast heavy industry was hard hit. It was the right place to go. Um, but now that I have a little bit more autonomy, I did end up in Sichuan province. And um, we met some unemployed youth. And what bothered me about meeting them was actually a group of them in terms of what education they had attained, what their preparation was for the labor market. Um, so I met a few who had done a degree, university degree, four year degree in fashion modeling. And when I asked them, what do you study for four years um, to get a degree in fashion modeling? I was told they studied walking and posing. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there might be, <laughs> that might be one of the challenges for me. It's a big challenge, more, more on a more serious note, in terms of making sure that human capital is properly invested in China. 
Um, by the way, um, most of the students were quite sensible. They weren't really going to be fashion models. They were studying, you know, they were going to work for an accountancy or something, which I thought was highly sensible. <laughs> um, the, uh, another third of the TFP comes from what I call reallocative efficiency. Now, these are one-off productivity improvements which are unlikely to be replicated. So let me try to explain what I mean. If you look at studies of TFP in China, the rate of change of total factor productivity, there was a notable slowdown in the mid-1990s. So lots of uh, questions around how that could be. So one thing you should always think about in terms of TFP is that, as I said, it's the unexplained residual. But within TFP, remember, it's the part that can't be, growth that can't be attributed to adding workers or adding investment. So everything that's unaccounted for is captured in TFP, including monetary and fiscal shocks. That tends to be one of the um, components in TFP that is cyclical rather than structural. And that's a common adjustment that lots of uh, studies would make. But in China's case, because of structural change, TFP likely slowed in the mid to, uh, in the mid to late 1990s because the one-off productivity improvements had been exhausted. So in other words, there's still some to be had, but most of the big ones had finished. So in other words, China in the mid-1990s in the ninth 12-year plan went from having 10 million state-owned enterprises uh, controlled by the center down to 300,000. They went from predominantly rural towards becoming a predominantly urban um, economy. They shrank the size of agriculture considerably. So the privatization of state-owned enterprises, the layoffs of a quarter of the urban population, the transition of workers from old heavy industry into newer industry and services, that structural change would have boosted productivity during the year of transition, but it would level off in the future. It's quite technical, so let me give you a practical example of what I mean. So in a previous career, I wasn't an academic. Um, I was a corporate lawyer. Um, and I was working for a New York firm. And I was sent to uh, China. And so I was in my office in Beijing. I had a Chinese secretary. And she uh, came to me one day and said, the biggest difference between working for you and my previous boss is that he was grateful if I did any work and you expect it. <laughs> and I said, yes, that's <laughs> considering I bill in six minute increments. Yes, I do actually <laughs> expect it. Um, but she used to work for a state owned enterprise. Um, as I said, no effort in state owned, no incentives to work. It's, you know, that's the, the big uh, challenge of uh, centrally planned economies. So in that year of transition, her productivity from going from the state owned enterprise to the private sector. Um, would have been huge. So it may have shot up, you know, 100%. Um, but in subsequent years, her productivity levels would grow at normal rates. So if you imagine a quarter of the workforce going from state owned enterprises to the private sector, structural change, that inflates the TFP rate, but it won't be replicated to the same extent in the future. Of course, there's still scope for some reallocation. You see that with the recent layoffs, which have just been announced in the steel and coal industries in China, but you wouldn't have the same structural shifts that you've had in the earlier parts of transition. So that means that TFP slowdown is probably linked to these one-off structural change in the past, which boosted productivity. But looking ahead, a lot more productivity gains need to come from innovation. And by the way, this is the hardest bubble to look behind. So in research that I've done uh, with um, John Van Rienen, who's a productivity expert at the LSC, we estimate that up to two thirds of Chinese innovation can be attributed to imitation. So this is um, things like uh, making incremental improvements to existing technology, which, by the way, is not unusual. That's how developing countries catch up. If you look at a very simple neoclassical growth model, the reason you have convergence in growth rates is because capital moves from high stock, low return countries with diminishing returns to 
low stock, therefore high return countries. And the transmission of technology, which is a very big part of Chinese FDI policy, means that there is learning to be had from predominantly joint venture um, agreements. So within joint venture agreements, I used to be a lawyer that negotiated these, you would have an annex which had a technology transfer agreement as part of it so that you don't have to pay monopoly rates in order to use the technology of Western firms in the production of, in your joint venture production. And more than that, you would require the hiring of local managers. You would have informal transmission of know-how and technology from the more advanced Western partner towards the Chinese partner. Now, before WTO accession, most of Chinese FDI was joint ventures. But after WTO accession, they're now predominantly wholly foreign-owned enterprises. The evidence suggests across different countries that spillover effects are less. Um, but perhaps at this stage of development, it wasn't as important as in the catch-up phase. But that also means the scope for positive spillovers of technology is probably less than in the past as well. As China moves into services, that's another reason uh, for that shift. So that does mean that China needs to have a lot more of its own technology, its own innovation to sustain its growth rate. And that is one of the hardest questions, I think, to answer for um, whether China can grow in the f well in the future. Um, I'll give you a quick anecdote about that before moving into what this means for rebalancing challenges, this raising of efficiency and productivity. Um, do you remember the movie Back to the Future? Now, most of you are too young to remember the original movie, but I'm sure you will have seen it as a classic. Um, but it was a movie in the 1980s, um, the first movie, where Michael J. Fox um, went back to the future. He went back to the 50s to keep his parents together so this bully Biff doesn't um, you know, ruin his uh, existence. And he met a scientist when he went back to the 50s, played by Christopher Lloyd. And Christopher Lloyd said, um, prove to me you're from the future. Tell me something about the future. And he said, um, you know, he's, no. who's the president of the United States? And Michael J. Fox said, Ronald Reagan. And uh, Christopher Lloyd said, a B-movie actor is leader of the free world. You're pulling my leg. You're not from the future. Tell me something else about the future. And he said, oh, um, OK. Well, Japan makes these really cool gadgets called VCRs. Some of you may not know what a VCR is. <laughs> um, but you put a cassette tape in it, and you can tape TV programs <laughs> that are not live. And he says, Japan makes the coolest gadgets. And Christopher Lloyd says, now I know you're not from the future, because made in Japan is just crap. <laughs> but within 30 years, Japan went from an imitator into an innovator. Can China do the same? We'll talk a bit more about that. But to me, that's the big question uh, for China. And nobody in the 50s clearly thought that was possible for Japan. Um, so summarizing the contributions to growth, um, factor accumulation, um, we talked about the reasons why those are unlikely to sustain China's growth in the future. So you have to look at what's driving TFP. If you look at human capital and you look at innovation minus imitation, that gives you a sense as to how much of China's growth is being driven by factors which can continue to be productive. Now, that means TFP's contribution in terms of the productive elements becomes a lot smaller than the 30-40% um, that we spoke of. The lower range may be only 17%. This is one of the major impetuses for China to reform its economy, to move ahead um, with efficiency-led reforms. And that's what underpins the rebalancing challenges. So, these are obviously not all the challenges for China. Different priorities will take place at different times. Um, but these are the rebalancing challenges that I've highlighted that China is looking to do in order to become uh, more sustainably uh, driven um, in terms of growth rates. And if you want to read more about it, um, obviously, besides plugging my own book, which I'm terrible at, which is why I'm not making eye contact, um, you can also look at um, China's 20, there's a World Bank report called China 2030. Um, I was um, fortunate enough to advise on that. It was done in conjunction with the State Council um, 
and it was led by the current premier, Li Keqiang, before he took office. And it basically outlines the main areas of Chinese reforms to 2030. And um, a lot of these factors have been discussed for some time. Um, but obviously, financial markets are a big part of it. But I'm going to focus on the real growth uh, reforms. Um, so I'm going to show you some data behind these in a moment, but let me just outline for you what I see as some of the challenges for China to raise that productivity levels. One thing is to rely more on their own markets and less on exports. That doesn't mean China is not going to grow via exports, but if you're the world's biggest trader, you're unlikely to have growth rates. Remember, this is growth components. That's going to see the same rates of increase in terms of exports driving growth. And you see China's current account surpluses come down a lot. And that is in reaction to the fact that China's market share is already so dominant. And since a decade ago, China now has its own middle class it can rely much more on domestic demand as a growth driver. And there are efficiency gains from having a more urbanized, services-oriented economy. You can deliver public services more efficiently. You can have infrastructure geared at urbanization, which helps to link together um, uh, parts of uh, mega cities, which is one thing China is um, building up. And all of those things mean you rely less on exports, which can be inefficient if it's driven by manufacturing, which is, has suffers from overcapacity, and more from developing um, your services sector, which is partly non-tradable. Um, so in other words, manufacturing tends to be geared at um, exports. Goods tend to be more tradable. Services are consumed locally. Um, so for instance, restaurants, cafes are local services. Um, I used to use the example of haircuts as a local service until uh, one of my better positioned colleagues mentioned that wasn't a good example because his wife flies from London to Paris to get her haircuts. So yes, services are also partly tradable, <laughs> um, but a lot of services are non-tradable. And they're also good for job creation because services are low end and, and high end. So you have a skills distribution there for job creation. So if you look at China's growth slowdown, they've always met their employment target, exceeded their employment growth targets, um, because actually the non-tradable services sector is a good uh, source of jobs and potentially of um, efficiency. China, if you look at the latest statistics for 2015, for the very first time, their services sector is now more than half of GDP. Um, and for an economy at this level of development, that's where it should be. It's taken them a while to get there, but they're now at that point. So China, and I'll show you in the chart later on, is now predominantly services, but still has an industrial base. Um, they haven't given up their industrial base, which can happen with uh, economies that become more services driven. The second point is if you want to rely more on your own consumers and less on American consumers, you have to raise consumption. Um, but you do that by reducing inefficient savings. I'll show you what I mean um, in the data later on. But the thing to say here is consumption measured as a share of GDP is a function of the savings rate. So whatever isn't consumed is saved. It's not necessarily that in absolute levels, consumption in China has been falling. It's not. It's that firms have been saving inefficiently. That's not terribly clear, but I'll show you um, in a moment what I mean by this rebalancing. So not all rebalancing is based on level. Some of it is just a function of macro statistics. But the overall policy lesson is China needs more consumption driven by income improvements. Um, and that doesn't mean changing the savings rate for consumers. It means more income-led growth rather than, say, um, debt-led growth. And this is one of the reasons why if wages are rising in China and they start to lose competitiveness on low-end manufacturing, that's not necessarily worrying if it means that China now has to raise wages in order to uh, provide better for its workers and lose some of the um, lower end manufacturing going to cheaper countries. Um, that's a perfectly um, normal pattern of development. Um, and in fact, the concept behind it is the Lewis model turning point. When you have, I mentioned China's workforce is shrinking now. 
Um, if you have a shrinking labor force, that generally means you're at the turning point of the Lewis model, which goes from agriculture to industry, um, rural areas to urban areas. Very cheap, abundant labor fuels the early stages of industrialization because their marginal product of labor is pretty much zero in the traditional sector. So that means you can get labor very cheaply into industries, and that's partly how China attracted so much foreign investment into its manufacturing sector in the early parts of reforms because labor was so cheap. Um, but when you hit the turning point of the Lewis model, labor is no longer so cheap because marginal product of labor has begun to equalize between the two sectors. To attract more workers, you need to have higher wages to move them from one sector to another sector. And that's a positive thing, by the way, because that means you're at a new stage of development and you need higher wages and higher incomes to attract workers. But it also means you're past the catch-up phase of industrialization, which means growth rates slow down. So I'll go into more what that means in a macro sense, but that's what lies behind that reform. Uh, growing the private sector. This is actually something which should be uh, pretty straightforward, but it's not because of the uh, state-owned enterprises. They still dominate um, key sectors, but most importantly, they dominate banking and credit. So private firms find it hard to get credit, even though, as I'll show you, they're much more efficient um, than state-owned firms. Um, increase innovation, we've talked a bit about that. I'll talk a bit more about that. Um, and then finally, continued opening. A new phase of development for China is a decade ago, they launched the Going Global Policy. So they now are investing almost as much overseas as they're receiving in terms of foreign direct investment. That's also a sign of a maturation of an economy. It's also a sign they're creating multinational companies by definition. Um, they're going out and buying uh, other companies. And that is a way of trying to create the Sonys, the Toshibas um, of the world. And I can say a bit more about that in a moment. So I talked about rebalancing towards services, and this just stresses the point that industry was half of GDP in 1979 and remains half of GDP now. So the increasing services sector is because agriculture is shrinking. China has less than 5% arable land, which is less than the global average. So agriculture that remains um, tends to be efficient. So the expansion of services and maintaining industrial, an industrial base is, in many ways, um, a rebalancing that's more sustainable. Consumption as a share of GDP, this is the chart that caused a lot of concern, obviously. Consumption fell to just 35% of GDP. It's now risen again to about 50% of GDP. Um, but the rise has to do with reducing savings because consumption has been re increasing in absolute terms, but savings have been increasing faster. And if you look at the savings rate, the household savings rate in magenta hasn't really changed in 20 years. The recent improvement in consumption is because firms have begun to save less and to invest more. Now, inefficient savings by firms, that's, some, that's the reform that's made a difference. In other words, state-owned enterprises are now being taxed a bit more. Um, they didn't pay dividends for a very long time, and that's one of the reasons why they save so much. Private firms can't access credit easily in the form of banking system, so they grow by retained earnings. So those are inefficient forms of savings. So as the savings rate for firms have come down, consumption as a share of GDP has improved. An economy that looks like this is Japan. If you look at um, what's happened to Japanese consumption, um, it's a very similar uh, picture. And one of the other reasons why we shouldn't worry too much about household savings um, in, by the same token is that as a society ages, you tend to dissave because you're no longer working. So in Japan's case, that's another reason for why um, it's not really household savings one should focus on, it's firm savings if you want to be more efficient. Uh, this is a hard one, reducing the state sector. State-owned enterprises and collectively owned enterprises used to comprise the totality of output. Private firms have begun to, obviously are now the biggest driver, but they began to make inroads, really, um, not until the late 1980s. That green 
is what used to be called ge ti hu. So those are individual enterprises, um, so self-employed people, firms which are very small, fewer than eight people, they're now absorbed into private firms. Um, in order to reduce the share of state-owned enterprises, which are still pretty dominant, um, that's the open question for China. It's, they're still important for jobs. State-owned enterprises still account for about a quarter um, of jobs, and that's one of the reasons why they continue to be preserved. That was always the point of a gradual dual-track transition. You preserve the state sector and employment and the social contract with the people while allowing the private sector to grow so that there are implicit transfers from the private sector to the state-owned sector that would preserve social stability. So this dual track transition was always very important in China's um, past reforms, but going forward, is this the right model if you have highly inefficient state-owned enterprises which now dominate credit? That's the question to debate for China. If you look at productivity, um, even privatized state-owned enterprises do not have productivity levels which are um, commensurate with uh, private enterprises. If you look at return on assets, similar, similar picture, they shouldn't be getting bank credits, uh, dominant bank credit, because they're not getting great returns. But if the state owns the banks and the enterprises, unsurprisingly, um, that creates um, a distorted uh, financial system. Signs of innovation. Um, I just put on there how closely patents granted have actually tracked China's development. The reason why it's hard to answer the innovation question in China, one of the reasons, is that um, normally in order to work out if a patent is innovative, you will look at applications to use that technology. So because China doesn't have data that tells you how many patents have usage applications in the same way American patent data does, it's actually really hard to tell how, much, how many of the patents are really innovative patents that other companies would pay to use that technology. Um, but nevertheless, huge push to formally uh, innovate in China, and you see that in terms of patents. If you look across the world, of the top five companies that file patents worldwide with WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Office, um, three of those five firms are Chinese. Um, but if you talk to these Chinese firms, as I have, um, they will say that some of that is because they're trying to prevent patent trolls. <laughs> if you file the patent, you prevent other people from, uh, you protect yourself, essentially. So having patents doesn't necessarily translate into innovation, but China has certainly pushed forward with a lot of patents despite a legal system which is still um, not um, entirely effective. Um, and then finally, China going global. 2003 was the first commercial outward M&A deal ever in China. So state-owned enterprises had always invested overseas, but because of the controlled currency and capital controls, China still uh, monitors outward investment. But in 2003, they allowed the first commercial deal, and you see the exponential growth in outward FDI from China. Um, the world's biggest telecoms company is Chinese, Huawei. Um, the world's biggest IPO is a Chinese company, Alibaba, um, who has a, which has a bigger reach uh, than Amazon. Um, Chinese companies have now moved into the global sphere. And the example I gave you earlier about Japan, that is one of the reasons for the push. Um, another reason is as the domestic economy slows down and as these companies look for new markets, um, it's very normal to want to go global and to, um, to compete internationally. Does that mean China will be able to overcome the middle income country trap? They need a lot of companies, I think, with the same brand recognition as Western companies that changes how we live. I think that would be one of the signs that China has managed it. Um, and then you'll be relieved to know I'm going to skip this, <laughs> which uh, links external to internal reforms. But let me just quickly say, until recently, China didn't have a market clearing interest rate. So it was always very hard to work out what the value of the currency is. So in a Salter Swan model, what you essentially have is the Y, which is output, and um, the theta, which is the real exchange rate. The determinant of aggregate um, demand, which is um, 
uh, picked up by the um, output in Y, that is to find an equilibrium depends on having some degree of uh, harmonization, well, it depends entirely on having a, a market clearing interest rate, which can give you an equilibrium exchange rate um, that tells you whether or not your um, uh, economy is um, at the right point in terms of output. Are you uh, inflating it too much? Are you running an excessive deficit? Are you running a surplus? All that kind of thing. So anyways, it's in the book if you're interested. Uh, but let me just finish with the next decades of reform. I think by within the next few years, in the 13 five-year plan, China will need to restructure its economy. I think that is um, quite apparent um, from their worries over the um, economic slowdown. By 2030, um, China will need to have much more uh, productivity driven by innovation. I think by that stage, they will be in the middle income country trap if they haven't um, achieve that and obviously that would be a sign that China it will end up like most middle income countries rather than become an economic superpower. And then finally I think w within a decade from then China will need to have stable and strong institutions. In other words um, China has a rule of law, has lots of legal reforms. My book before this one um, was called Enterprising China um, Business uh, legal, I should remember the names of my type, the titles of my books. It was also published by OUP, and it's, it's um, called Enterprising China, Business, Economic, and Legal Reform since 1979. And that book focused on the numerous legal and institutional changes in China that have paved the way for the market economy. And a lot of those are informal, things like social capital and guanxi. But looking ahead, one of my arguments is they need to have a lot more formal institutions, effective rule of law, a rule of law that can stand up to the rule of party, the kind of transparency and certainty in regulatory regimes. All of those things will need to be in place if China wishes to have a stable economy, because having a big economy, a fast-growing economy, is not the same thing as having a, a stable economy that brings prosperity to its people. And to me, that has to be the next phase of reforms. But, um, and that's a big but, um, for China to hit all of these uh, landmarks depends on a lot of growth factors that we've described, as well as other changes beyond economics. So I think it's a very exciting time uh, to think about China. And for me, the question is still, we know the making, China has the makings of an economic superpower. And in some respects, it's already done a remarkable job in lifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. And over the next three decades, I think, will yield a fascinating array of issues and um, reforms to think about if China wants to um, continue to do what is done so well in the first 30 years, but realize the path ahead is really challenging, but in a different sort of way. Um, so anyways, I'm going to stop here so we can uh, do in Q&A. Thank you so much for your attention thus far.